Next Curve. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this episode of the Rethink Podcast. I'm Leonard Lee, Managing Director of Next Curve, and today I have a very special guest, Samir Lalwani, co founder of Digital Twin Sim. Joining me to talk about millimeter wave. Yes, millimeter wave and the use of digital models for modeling and planning 5G networks. So Samir, um, really great to have you. Tell our audience a little bit about your company and what you do. Hi, um, I and a colleague of mine founded Digital Twin Sim with our goal of advising telecom companies worldwide on technical and financial and strategic implications of technology decisions. And very soon we realized that, you know, the the world was changing. For millimeter wave, you needed to work with very high resolution data, which was becoming easily available through from USGS or commercial companies like Nearmap. Mm. At the same time, compute was also becoming very cheap, mainly from uh, public uh, services like AWS. And we decided to combine these resources and build tools to help companies model networks at very, very high resolution. So thanks for that, Samir. Uh, Today, we'll touch on the following four points. Uh, Millimeter wave modeling challenges, what are they? Uh, Use cases for network modeling and simulation. Then we'll talk about geo demographics that drive MNO strategies for millimeter wave. And then finally, we'll cap everything off with uh, some key considerations for network economics with 5G. Um, So Samir, why don't we start off with this first item, which is millimeter wave modeling challenges. What are they? What are some of the problems that you're solving here with your operator customers uh, in planning millimeter wave deployment? What are some of the challenges with that spectrum to begin with? Yeah, so I I mean, from a basic theory point of view, millimeter wave bands are really frequency bands where the wavelength is less than one centimeter. That's why it's called millimeter wave. Uh, A problem with that band is it really cannot penetrate anything. You may get very little foliage penetration, but no, not much building penetration. So if you want to offer services, you really need close to line of sight um, to be able to cover any building. Now, traditionally, when we have planned networks, we we have used data, which would be, you know, five, 10 meter resolution, but that's not good enough especially when you want to guarantee coverage. So what we really decided to do is build models of cities at 10, 15 centimeter resolution, where we are able to account for every single tree, bush, shed in the city and be able to tell you with confidence that can you cover this specific wall of this building or not? or what is the perfect CPE location, which would allow you to serve your customers. Yeah. So one of the topics we would like to cover are is Teragraph modeling, which was really the first use case our company focused on. Uh, in late 2018, Teragraph was news a lot. And we realized that if you want to plan networks which have links of few hundreds of meters while deploying thousands of nodes, you really need to automate that process. Mm -hmm. And we developed tools which would allow you to precisely place nodes, calculate traffic flows, and also identify the POP locations which would be needed Mm -hmm. along with oxygen and rain fade calculations. Mm -hmm. So, Yeah, so uh, really quickly, uh, Samir, Teragraph, what is it? And what frequency range are we talking about here in terms of uh, spectrum? Yes, so Teragraph um, was a technology developed by Facebook or Meta now. now. 
Uh, it runs at 60 gigahertz frequency band. Um, the good thing about that is it's an unlicensed band. So anyone right. is free to do deployments there, mm -hmm. but the cons are uh, there is significant oxygen losses and rain feed issues in that frequency band, due to which each link is limited to around 200 meters per hop. Uh -huh. But you can build a mesh network to make it much more resilient than what a single hop link would be. Mm -hmm. And so that's a frequency that's actually much higher than what uh, the MNOs have purchased in their, uh, in, in, you know, uh, the yes. millimeter wave auctions uh, two, three years ago, right? Yes, that's right. It, th this frequency band is much more unfavorable to propagation. <laughs> that's one of the reasons why it was offered. Right, before. right. So this is like a super tough use case then. For, yes. For, yeah, okay. So... This is a demo of a Teragraph network, which actually is being planned for deployment right now. What you see is a fire station, which we are going to zoom into. Uh, that is a pop location that will be used, okay? So what we really need to do is go from this fire station and connect other buildings nearby. Mm -hmm. uh, the color shades that you're seeing right now is the DSM data for this region. DSM is really digital surface map or very high resolution 3D data. Okay, and so what we're using is 20 centimeter data. Using that data, we are able to calculate line of sight to every single building on the map. The orange regions that you see mark places of obstruction. So for example, in this picture, the orange region we just showed was a tree branch which was coming in between. We'll see another example here where we are able to show a pole which is coming in between. Mm. So th this tells you the type of accuracy at which we are able to do our analytics. And we can easily move the node on that building on top to a slightly different location, a few feet away to try to bypass that pole. Mm. So these are the techniques we use for our modeling. Now, once we have this information, we can quantify each link as red or green, where red says that there's an yeah. obstruction can't be used, while green tells you that, hey, this link is perfect, you can use it. Mm -hmm. So with this information, you then go and get rid of all the red links, which we do here, and are, are left with a subset of links which work. And then we run our graph algorithms on top of this to figure out which are the optimal nodes which we should uh, keep, what the traffic flow would look like, what's the utilization of each link, oxygen loss of each link, and thus come up with an optimal network which meets your customer's uh, capacity or budget needs. Hmm. Wow, that's a tremendous amount of data that you must be using uh and you're we're looking at basically a digital model of an entire city right a, a that's right graphical and uh geometrically accurate spatially accurate model yes that's right that's so that's why i was saying it at millimeter wave even a small tree branch coming in between can mm. have very adverse conditions. That's why we need to right. work with this very high resolution data mm. and develop techniques to be able to paralyze the mm. compute load. Right. Um, yeah. Oh, to be able to do these things. Pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. Mm. And to do this, like you were saying, physically, um, site for site, uh, using measurement tools in the conventional way would be extremely expensive and difficult. Yes, that, that's true. So for sub six gigahertz, what used to happen is the operators would add a link budget margin, mm -hmm. let's say 15, 20 dB additional link budget margin, and then go with the assumption that this margin 
would be enough to get us in building or in car coverage. Mm-hmm. Now, with millimeter wave, you really can't do it. You have to right. know for certain or for, for with a certainty whether you can get to that point or not. Right, right. And just out of curiosity, do, do, does you, your modeling factor in reflections? Because- no, we do not. Uh, Right now, we are ignoring reflections. One of the things issues with reflections is it is very dependent on type of material on which you are interacting with. Right. And that information is usually not available. Mm-hmm. And plus, um, it's difficult to know what the reflected angle and signal strength would be. Right, so right. what we are trying to stay with are the links on which we can guarantee coverage guarantee. Right, with right. close to 100% confidence. Okay, right. And then reflections would just be a conditional or situational thing, right? Yes. It also would be highly dependent on the position of the UE. Mm-hmm. Yes. Right? Okay, that's interesting. No, I, I mean, it's uh, thought-provoking stuff for mm-hmm. sure. Okay. So the same uh, information I just showed uh, can also be visualized in 3D. This really shows the point cloud on which we have done this analysis. Um, For example, here we are going from a pop location, which was at a fire station, going to the precise CN location on top of a building. Mm -hmm. We can also use this data to zoom into other parts of the map and measure node heights or tree heights or building heights, things like that. Mm -hmm. For example, we have a pole which we are planning to deploy there. Mm -hmm. And this is showing what's the height of pole that, you know, is needed to get over foliage. Right. Hmm. So your question about point cloud, Um, when we are, the way this data is collected is either US government or private companies like NearMap fly planes over large, vast amounts of territory. And for each point in 3D space, they collect X, Y, Z information, which is really similar to latitude, longitude, height above sea level, along with color information, okay? So you can imagine what you're looking at right now are billions of points in 3D space, okay? And that's what is called, uh, traditionally the term used for that is point clouds or LIDAR data. And that's what you are looking at right now. This is LIDAR data for the city of Eureka in California. Oh, wow. Very cool, very cool. So the next use case we would like to talk about is microwave backhaul planning. So our initial work was focused on telegraph planning, which are very, very short lengths. But we saw serious interest from various MNOs on using the same techniques for planning microwave links. Now, these links are usually in the lower frequency band on, let's say, around 11 gigahertz, but they can be close to 10 kilometers long. Okay. Traditionally, to qualify a link takes around a week or so with multiple teams and costs around $3,000 in man hours. Okay. And requires tower climbers, bucket trucks, permission. It's it's a pretty involved process. And the MNO who we were talking to did not have a very good fiber presence but they needed to plan large number of links covering a city. And we offered to do it for them using the same techniques we just demonstrated. Um, By by these techniques, we can give you an answer in let's say one or two days at a much lower price with no field uh, visit requirements. What you're seeing here is a region north of Las Vegas. This is more than 100 square kilometers big. We need to qualify buildings that were marked here. So site number D that we are zooming into is a site location which needs to be connected to the other links. 
Now, since this data is so large in terms of distances, instead of trying to download all of the DSM data, what we really do is just download a DSM data in a very narrow strip along the link that needs to be qualified. So what you see here are now the DSM, this is the DSM data that we have downloaded and the links which are qualified along those DSM, along that DSM data. So here what you see is we are zooming into a region where there's an obstruction. As we go in nearer, you'll realize this is a small hill which is coming in between. And this shows exactly the point at which we are, um, the link is intersecting with the hill. And because this data is at 15 centimeter resolution, we can tell you with that accuracy exactly at which point the link enters that um, hill. Okay. Same way, if there's a tree branch which comes in, let's say five kilometers or five miles away, we can tell you, hey, this branch is coming in. You either need to move your link to a different side of the building or maybe increase it by a bit. So as um, very similar to what we had before, if we zoom out here. We can create a detailed report showing every single link which works and the ones which don't work as red or green links. And for each link, we're able to give you a report of what's the path loss, what's the additional rain margin you need to add, or maybe even gases losses if it's uh, relevant to that frequency band. Wow, that's pretty cool. So for microwave, then um, the gas loss, you said that it's called gas loss? Yeah, so, uh, so there are tables published by ITU which oh. specify how much gas loss happens um, based on a frequency. So for most frequency bands, it's not a very big issue. It's really much more important at 60 gigahertz. And, but it's part of the computation that we do anyway. Uh, rain loss tends to become a much more bigger issue for microwave links based on geography. So this, this link was in Vegas. It's not as important. But if you go to Southeast Asia or monsoon re regions, that will right. be a much bigger impact. Right. Now, what about what about like fog or any kind of inclement weather, especially for millimeter wave? Fog, I don't think has as much impact. Now, the moisture content, though, it does. And so your your model doesn't necessarily factor that stuff in those, those so, things so, in. Uh, the the fact is, we actually do. Um, again, like I said, the, these are standard tables published by ITU. So based on your specific geography, you can specify what, um, con what uh, availability I want for my link. And it's able to tell you that for that specific spot, how much link margin you need for that specific frequency band and hop distance. So we do those computations, but rely on models developed by ITU for that. Oh, okay. All right, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. The, the techniques we showed to you for what we developed for Teragraph and for microwave link qualification were originally focused only on millimeter wave band. But the cool thing is we realized, you know, there's no reason why we could not use these for sub six gigahertz band also. Mm -hmm. So you may be aware there's a US Department of Agriculture reconnect uh, funding program right now where USDA is providing funding to serve under or to connect underserved regions across United States, okay? One of the primary requirements there is that you need to serve all premises, okay? You have to be able to do that to get that funding. Now for rural connectivity, 
Most of the solutions are sub-6 gigahertz using CVRS band or other proprietary technologies. Okay. Now, these technologies are, are the UEs are always mounted outside, usually you know, on the roof line. So they do not require perfect line of sight, but they still do need what you call near line of sight which means they will be able to handle some amount of foliage in between, but not, not much else, okay? And what we realized, we could use our high resolution modeling techniques to easily measure exactly the amount of foliage that we are going through and qualify buildings on an individual building basis. So let me show a video to wow. you now about how we are doing this work. So what you see here is a region which has been identified for um, this rural funding. There's a site in the middle of very heavy wooden terrain. We know information about where every single building is. Based on that, we go and retrieve DSM data going to each building and compute line of sight to every building along with where the obstructions are. Very similar to what we had shown to you earlier. But this work is now being done for, a, uh, I think a three gigahertz or a six or a five gigahertz technology. When you zoom in, you can now see where the buildings are and even classify buildings which can be covered. So the blue buildings are the ones which we have connectivity to from a site placed at that star location. If we turn off the DSM, you can see where the buildings are. But as you can see, this is a very, very sparse area. Now, we need very high confidence that we can cover every single building before we can apply for any of that US Department of Agriculture funding. The other use cases which we have developed using these technologies are solutions for 5G network planning where we use high resolution data to figure out what are the optimal sites and to quantify coverage of each site. We've also built models for indoor use cases where we modeled an indoor deployment for IT, IoT use case in a warehouse or a model for mesh connectivity in an enterprise environment. But those, the, these projects were done for specific clients, so I can't really show any material on that. Okay, so um, would the methods and the tools that you have, would they be applicable? I mean, you mentioned here a warehouse, uh, IoT use case. Uh, would they be applicable for, let's say, uh, you know, planning a, a 5G network for a, a factory, some sort of industrial environment? Yes, that, that's exactly what we used it for. Um, we, again, were looking at a millimeter wave use case. We had very detailed plans of a warehouse where we needed 100% connectivity, and that's what we use it for. How many nodes would be needed? What site sort of data rate and capacities we would be able to get? So the next topic I want to talk about is geodemographics. So traditionally, this has really been used for targeted marketing. It helps you understand your market and identify who and where your target customers are. And if, if you see the work we shared previously, we're going into very, very detailed network planning um, and decision-making about which specific households you can cover. But before you get to that stage, you really need to identify which markets do you need to focus on? And this is where geodemographics becomes very useful. Here's some work we have been doing for underserved countries where we bring in a large number of varied data sets. For example, what the population distribution is, what's the electricity reliability, what's relative wealth index, um, age distribution, um, education level. So, bring in large amounts of data sets and use, combine all of that information to identify what are the uncovered populations who could benefit from 
um, connectivity. The same technique which I just showed for, for Africa or countries in Africa can also be used to target uh, underserved regions in the United States. What you see here are clusters that we have identified which are uncovered in the United States and have a medium to low income. So if you look at the regions which are colored red and blue, those are the ones with poor connectivity from incumbent operators while have income above a certain level. And this, this data set can be combined with the US Department of Agriculture funding to def define which regions we can focus on. So what you're seeing here right now is the region which I showed to you earlier, where we were trying to put in a rural site. Uh, this, this brings us towards the end of our presentation. All this information about where the site should go, how many sites are needed, what's the coverage they can give, what's the income level in those neighborhoods can then be used to build a network economics and business case um, based on constraints defined in terms of budgets and link budgets. We can actually optimize our networks to meet both technical and economic objectives and also do a comparative analysis if you're trying to do decision making between different technologies. Wow, that's really interesting. So it looks like uh, you've taken this um, initial model for supporting network planning and design uh, to now address new types of uh, applications, uh, helping decision making around, um, you know, like you're saying, business case development, or even just um, figuring out where where are the pockets of economic value that a, a MNO or a, a, a service provider might be able to pursue. Uh, yes, that's true. Actually, the flow of the presentation is like that, but yeah. from our background, it actually started the other way. Our, our, our background really was coming from Qualcomm in network economics and business case development. So yeah. we would work on every new wireless technology and quantify its economic benefits right. or costs of deployment. So right. In some way, we are trying to cover the full value chain of any new technology um, that needs to be right. deployed, both from detailed modeling point of view to the economic analysis point of view. Yeah, that's really cool. I, the big takeaway for me here is that um, you're showcasing the benefits of digital modeling and being able to use it to reduce the cost of planning and get to this very granular level of specificity in terms of uh, how you can configure uh, or deploy um, sites and then configure them to uh, achieve uh, certain types of um, business targets or economic uh, goals for the network. I mean, that, that's sort of the impression that I'm get, getting um, from the kind of work that you seem to be doing with your clients and what you've showcased. Yeah, yes, that, that's correct. Um, but one of the things we realized was this type of work was being done under in MNOs, but it's extremely siloed. So the network planning team would be doing their own planning, um, uh -huh. though at a lower resolution. You would have your marketing team using their own tools to target uh -huh. specific markets. You have your, um, what do you call, infrastructure planning team doing things, you know, in a uh -huh. separate way. And there's no one who is unifying all of that data and, you know, looking at the big picture. Right, but but so millimeter wave is that has become a bit of a uh, I don't know what a good word I guess one word that can be be used to describe it is a little bit of a disappointment, <laughs> but it seems like um, 
what you're able to do is bring down the cost of of um, modeling and networks um, four millimeter wave, which again needs that higher level of resolution, right? Yes. Right, because you mentioned that most of the MNOs right now they're dealing with a lower level of resolution, but. Uh, the thing that I'm taking away is that in order for these types of digital models and planning tools to be uh, useful for these higher band frequencies, you need much higher resolution, right? Because like you were saying, a branch, literally a, a tree branch can get in the way of quality of service mm -hmm. uh, for, a, for a link. Yes. Right? So, so some of it really is, you know, more historical or the way they have done things, the tools which I demonstrated require significantly more computing capability than what's normally used or traditionally has right. been used. Uh -huh. And the operators are slow to adopt those. Okay, these bringing additional complexities, you need to upgrade the skill level of your employees. Right. So that all is there. Mm. And on your point about, you know, the disappointments with 5G, so I've been working in this. Well, I didn't say 5G. I said but millimeter, millimeter wave millimeter. because there were yes. a lot of, a lot of, you know, there was a lot of expectation built into yes. millimeter wave. And, uh, you know, we've seen very uh, marginal adoption. There's only a few yes. carriers in the world who've actually deployed it and, and very few, if any, that are monetizing. But, you know, I, I, the point I'm making here is that it, 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 I think my take is this, is that you guys are providing a, a really compelling planning tool to, uh, for MNOs to discover where these uh, economic opportunities are for their millimeter wave investments whether they've made those investments already or you know quite um, far back in the past quite honestly right there's a lot of u.s operators who who uh, secured millimeter wave holdings uh two years ago um but then now there are there are these other operators that are looking at millimeter wave but may have not yet um, you know, thought through, okay, um, where are those uh, net new opportunities uh, to uh, deliver new services uh, based on these geodemographics that you had um, outlined that yes. will uh, maybe help them monetize. I mean, everyone talks about monetizing uh, 5G, right? Millimeter wave was that big hope. You know, maybe you guys are pro providing one of those tools to help these uh, MNOs that are now considering millimeter wave to discover what those value opportunities are. Yeah. I don't know. I'm no, just that, that's putting right. that out but, there. But <laughs> one of the things I love about our industry is, or at least, you know, I've been working in this since 2G times, that yeah. every time we initially, um, overestimate that how uh, you know market adoption will be it starts off slow and then far exceeds any of our expectations ever and you can see that happen with everything 1g 2g 3g 4g in the earlier years we'll be say oh nothing's happening and it's way beyond or less than what we predicted but you go three four five years down the line it's way beyond what you ever thought uh, you know is possible. So I, I'm still very optimistic that we're going to have a lot of fun over the next four or five years. <laughs> well, yeah, we'll have fun, but I, I, I mean, I think it's still going to be a tough road. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. And, yes. you know, honestly, there's, there's some folks who will argue that we didn't get as much out of uh, these previous generations. And we're, you know, I often say, I'm still waiting for my LTE, but that's neither mm -hmm. here or there. Um, and, and 5G definitely has a long way to go, um, especially with the millimeter wave uh, spectrum and the promise. Um, yes. But I, I mean, I, I think, you know, the thing that's going to be useful for 
my audience, the next curve audience, is that the work that you do, uh, can, uh, the way I look at it, could be a really great discovery tool. So for those operators that are looking at uh, possibly tapping into millimeter wave, y you can start to visualize and get data that can help you um, uh, you know, uh, with that discovery process and maybe uh, support the ideation of new services and new um, ways of um, providing um, coverage, in, you know, in this very difficult spectrum. Yes. Okay. Well, hey, uh, Samir, uh, thanks for joining me on this Rethink podcast. I really appreciate the time that you took to uh, share what um, you do and um, help our audience understand the type of um, tools and technology that are available in planning uh, 5G and mil in particular millimeter wave um, based networks. So appreciate that very much. So uh, why don't you take a, a moment here to uh, share with our audience how they can reach out to you and find out more about Digital Twin Sim. Yes, yeah, so the first place you could do is check out our website. It's www.digitaltwinsim.com. The other thing is you can also check out my LinkedIn, um, which is Lalwani Samir. Uh, I provide both the links there. Um, a lot of the content or material I showed there is covered in more detail on these websites, though not as good as in terms of visualizations, but, okay. and feel free to reach out to us. Um, let's see how we can work together. Okay, wonderful. And to our listeners and viewers, thanks for joining us. Uh, please subscribe to the Next Curve YouTube and Apple podcast channels and visit us at www.next-curve.com. Subscribe to our site and you'll be notified when we publish new articles and research content like this webcast here. Uh, and you can also uh, subscribe to our media channel, which is a, um, a link under our um, uh, research tab on our site. So until next time, uh, be safe and st um, stay healthy. Samir, once again, thank you. Thank you very much. Visit us at www.next-curve.com.